SpaceX is getting close to Starship's second orbital test flight. Super Heavy Booster 9 has recently completed its third cryogenic proof test and is now getting ready for its static fire test campaign. Booster 9 underwent a spin prime test on Friday, August 4. It appears that the test included all 33 of the booster's Raptor engines. Before the test, frost and condensation began to form on the liquid oxygen tank of Booster 9, indicating the loading of liquid oxygen into the vehicle. The engines eventually started venting, signaling that engine chill had started. The Fire Extinguisher and Detonation Suppression System, or FireX, designed to purge the orbital launch mount with high-pressure nitrogen gas and water, was activated next. Finally, the spin prime test was conducted, where the engine's liquid oxygen turbo pump is spun up to operating speeds and liquid oxygen is flowed through it, effectively ensuring that the engine oxygen pumps work as expected. With the successful completion of the spin prime test, SpaceX will now move on to the static fire tests of Booster 9. Teams are in the final phase of preparing the orbital launch mount for the static fire test campaign. The water-cooled steel plates that will dump thousands of gallons of water under the launch mount to deflect the energy of the 33 Raptor engines of Super Heavy was tested a week ago. Painting work on the launch mount legs is in progress and all the scaffoldings have recently been removed. SpaceX recently poured high-strength Fondag concrete on the region outside the steel plates to ensure the pad is far more robust than it was before. Trucks carrying liquid methane and liquid oxygen are arriving at the launch site to fill the tank farm storage tanks with propellants for static fire tests. Initial static fire tests will likely involve only a few booster engines, and the test campaign will end with a full 33-engine static fire. Once Booster 9 completes all its pre-launch tests, the next major milestone will be a Starship full stack, followed by a wet dress rehearsal. The wet dress rehearsal includes many of the procedures SpaceX engineers will perform on launch day, such as pumping propellants into the vehicle's super heavy first stage and Starship upper stage, and a launch day countdown rehearsal that stops a few seconds before the engine fires. Once all pre-launch tests are complete and SpaceX is granted a launch license by the Federal Aviation Administration, Starship will once again lift off from Starbase to orbit. The Starship hot staging test article was moved to the Massey's test facility last Sunday night. SpaceX announced in June that it plans to include hot staging on the Starship, starting with its next orbital flight. The technique involves igniting the engines on the Starship's upper stage just before stage separation, while still attached to its booster stage. This will potentially increase the Starship's payload to orbit by 10%, as thrusting will not be paused during flight. SpaceX plans to add an interstage section on top of Super Heavy to allow the exhaust from the upper stage to escape during hot staging. The test article moved to Massey's is designed to test the structural integrity of the interstage. The test article consists of three sections, a Starship aft skirt, the interstage ring section, and a booster forward dome with grid fin simulators. The interstage is connected to the booster and ship sections with the help of clamps. During an actual flight, the interstage clamps on the ship side will release the Starship during stage separation. The vents on the interstage are not evenly placed. They are designed in three groups of two to expel the Starship exhaust during hot staging efficiently. The vertical supports have triangular stringers inside to increase the structural integrity of the interstage ring. It will also help direct the Starship upper stage exhaust out. After arriving at Massey's, the forward dome interstage assembly was lifted and placed atop the can crusher test stand, followed by the ship aft skirt on top of the interstage ring. The can crusher cap was then placed on top of the aft skirt. A can crusher test rig is basically a test stand designed to simulate the force of a Starship launch on test articles to make sure the components can withstand the stresses of the actual flight. During the test, a set of 20 cables connected to hydraulic rams will squeeze the test tank down to simulate the maximum forces predicted during flight. If the interstage test article passes the can crusher test, SpaceX will install an interstage similar to the current design on Booster 9 ahead of the orbital test flight. However, if the test article fails to bear the stresses during the can crusher test, SpaceX will have to redesign the interstage, delaying the next orbital test flight. Keep an eye on LabPadre's Raptor Roost Cam for the can crusher test, which could occur in the coming days. Starship 28, which arrived at Massey's on July 21, went through its first cryogenic proof test last week. The ship's methane and oxygen tanks were completely filled during the test. The vehicle was kept in that fully loaded state for several hours before detanking. Ship 28 underwent a similar cryogenic proof test on Thursday, August 3. The nose cone payload bay assembly of Ship 30 was stacked on top of the forward dome last Monday. The ship is three stacks away from completion. 
One of the two antennae that tracked Starship during its flight was recently decommissioned. It appears that SpaceX intends to replace the current antennae with new ones. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. An Antares launch vehicle blasted off from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in Virginia on Tuesday, August 1, carrying the NG-19 Cygnus cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. The Cygnus spacecraft was named S. Laurel Clark, in honor of one of the astronauts who perished in the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster in 2003. Around eight minutes after liftoff, the Cygnus separated from the Antares rocket's second stage and began its journey to the ISS. The NG-19 mission carried 3,785 kilograms of research investigations, equipment, and foodstuffs to replenish supplies for the space station's current and upcoming crews. Please check out the link in the description to get the complete list of NASA science investigations and cargo launched on the mission. The Cygnus NG-19 spacecraft arrived at the ISS on Friday, August 4. Astronauts aboard the space station captured the spacecraft with Canadarm2 robotic arm to then berth it at one of the ports on the U.S. segment of the station. The spacecraft will remain at the station for at least three months before departing with trash to be disposed of through destructive re-entry. The August 1 launch was the final flight of the current version of the Antares rocket, designated Antares 230+, powered by a Ukrainian-built first stage with Russian-made engines. Supply lines for Antares were disrupted when Russia invaded Ukraine in February of last year. In response, Northrop Grumman announced an agreement with Firefly Aerospace to manufacture engines and a new first stage for an upgraded Antares 330 series rocket, which is scheduled to launch in the second half of next year. Voyager 2 is still broadcasting feigned signals from deep space after a communications breakdown two weeks ago. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are twin spacecraft launched by NASA in 1977, with the primary goal of exploring the outer solar system. Despite being over four decades old, they remain operational and continue to return valuable scientific data. Voyager 2, which entered interstellar space in 2018 and is currently over 19.9 billion kilometers away from Earth, experienced a communication failure with NASA's Deep Space Network ground antennas on June 21. Communications with Voyager 2 were severed due to a set of wrong commands that accidentally moved the spacecraft's antenna two degrees from Earth. On July 31, NASA detected a feigned hint of a carrier signal from Voyager 2. If the antenna was correctly aligned, this signal would typically contain real-time data from the spacecraft. However, because it isn't aligned, the signal wasn't strong enough to extract anything from it. NASA will next send a command to Voyager 2, asking the spacecraft to point itself toward Earth. If that does not work, we'll have to wait until October 15. Voyager 2 is pre-programmed to reset its orientation several times a year to keep its antenna directed at Earth to regain communication in case of troubles like the one that occurred now. Nearly 24 billion kilometers from Earth, Voyager 1 is still functioning normally and maintaining contact with the deep space network. Rocket Lab will launch an Earth-observing radar satellite for Capella Space as early as Sunday, August 6, during a two-hour window that opens at 5 a.m. UTC. The mission, dubbed We Love the Nightlife, will be Rocket Lab's first of four planned launches to deliver Capella Space's Acadia Synthetic Aperture Radar satellites into orbit. Rocket Lab is working to make Electron's first stage reusable, and the company has so far recovered Electron boosters in a handful of missions to date. However, there will be no such recovery operations on Sunday's mission. If all goes according to plan on Sunday, the Acadia spacecraft will be deployed into a 640 km circular low Earth orbit 58 minutes after liftoff. Synthetic aperture radar satellites emit radar signals towards the Earth and measure how they are scattered after coming into contact with the Earth's surface. The signals can penetrate through clouds to see the covered surface underneath, allowing satellites to have a full view of the Earth's surface, regardless of atmospheric or lighting conditions. Compared with traditional optical imaging, synthetic aperture radar imaging provides more details about the topography of the Earth. Capella's synthetic aperture radar satellite constellation provides access to information to a number of industries worldwide, including defense and intelligence, supply chain, insurance, maritime and others. Capella's next-generation Acadia satellites will expand the company's existing constellation to provide the highest quality imagery, the best ground range resolution, and the fastest order to delivery speeds available from any commercial provider. SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket launched the Intelsat G37 communications satellite into orbit on August 3 from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. It was the 52nd orbital launch for SpaceX this year. 
The Falcon 9 first stage booster separated from the upper stage 2 minutes and 40 seconds after liftoff and successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean, marking the sixth landing for this particular booster. The Falcon 9 upper stage deployed the satellite into an elliptical geosynchronous transfer orbit 32 minutes after liftoff. It will take about three weeks for the satellite to maneuver itself into a geostationary orbit more than 35,000 kilometers above the equator. The Galaxy 37 communications satellite will be jointly operated by Intelsat and JSAT International. The Maxer built satellite will expand television and telecommunications access for North America and help free up swaths of the airwaves for 5G wireless communications service. The satellite is equipped with four deployable antenna reflectors for both C-band and KU-band transmissions. With the successful launch of Galaxy 37, Intelsat has set a new record for the commercial satellite industry by sending eight geostationary satellites into space in less than 10 months. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.